creating something that holds a roof up. I see walls in the sense of a skin that can breathe, expand, shed, sweat, grow. Um, so when we think about these technologies, where I could see us perhaps collaborating is because I'm not, I'm not an inventor, but if we're going to shift the collective perception of yeah. technology, yeah. we yeah. have to have biomimicry, and we can use form-based biomimicry in your example to showcase, to show people the story, to get them into the story of biomimicry, to see the sexy example and say, well, that's interesting, that emulated nature, and then as soon as they get that, then they see nature's doing all of the same things yeah. that we are in the same context, but in a very different way. Never would they have the problems of dealing with these toxic chemicals in a, in a microchip plant or, um, because it wouldn't do that. So to answer that question, that was an interesting like aha moment for me, but to answer your question, the biomimicry incubator space is a bottom-up approach that I'm taking in Canada. So to shift our perception, I'm working top-down and bottom-up. Top-down is working with landowners and architects to apply principles of biomimicry to housing design and land development. That's my focus. So I work with city builders, landowners, um, politicians in Canada. And that's fun for me because it's trying to shift this existing system that we've created. So I've inherited, we've all inherited this system. This system's been based on a paradigm from long ago. Newtonian thinking, religions, all these different things have resulted in what we have today. And that's fine. The things that we can do are incredible, but we know that it's not sustainable. So if we can work and start to play with the existing systems, uh, applying these sustainable technologies, that will get us somewhere. But what I'm really excited about is the bottom-up disruption that can be created through this biomimicry incubator space where people are creating technologies from a new paradigm. So it's fundamentally about paradigm shifting and allowing young or whoever, creative people, to tap their creative potential, step into a new source, I call it, of creativity. And when you build from that paradigm and apply it to this technology, it will be disrupted because people will see it and say, that looks very different. It's because it comes from a different source. It's not our own intelligence. It's coming from a natural intelligence or even a spiritual intelligence that, um, that I think will disrupt the system in a very powerful way. So those are my two approaches. And the Biomimicry Commons is our first attempt at this. So it's an incubator, educator, disruptor space where I'm teaching the methodology of biomimicry, but also the methodology of self, um, you know, a, getting people into their creative potential, accessing people's creative potential so that they can use biomimicry to create something that's never been seen before. Um, one of the partners, Jay Harmon, I don't know if you know him, but he's in California, he's a biomimicry uh, technologist, and he built a Pax Impeller which pulls water emulating the bathtub vortex, if you've seen that. He was inspired by kelp. So kelp in a coastal region, when the wave crashes, will turn. And he was, he was interested in why. And it's because nature moves with the flow of its environment. And so instead of getting ripped out of the ground, the kelp intuitively understands to curl so that the, when, when the wave crashes, it doesn't pull the kelp off the ground. So he took that idea, that spiraling idea, which is ubiquitous in nature, our skin pores, have that Fibonacci spiral. Our ear, our ear hole has that Fibonacci spiral. You see all the plants, the patterning of plants is a Fibonacci spiral. He took that spiral and make it, made an impeller that's pulling fluids, and it's a much more efficient fan, or boat propeller, or um, uh, water pump, than any propeller that we have, and it doesn't have the cavitation that is caused. When you're pushing water, you'll have many explosions on the propeller. And that wears down the propeller because you have such great friction. But he's pulling water with a great efficiency. And we're partnering with him because, and he's uh, offering to bring the technologies to Canada, because that's an example of a form where it looks like something we've never seen before. It doesn't look like the old technology. It's beautiful, it's simple, and it allows us to enter into the space of biomimicry, into that story of shifting our perception. So, that's fundamentally what I'm up to, is trying to shift our perceptions to the development of technologies and the kind of dis disruption of existing, existing systems. And how receptive have architects been to what you have been offering? Uh, I'm having, for example, so I'm an engineer actually, I'm not an architect. Um, the architects have been coming to me when I tell them about biomimicry, 
And when I tell anyone about biomimicry, there's an intuitive understanding that clicks, I see. People get it at a fundamental level. Yes, of course, nature has incredible forms, processes, and systems. And it's doing it very differently than humans are. It's cleaning air, it's pumping water, like a tree is pumping water without mechanical devices or electricity. 300 feet sometimes. That's incredible. Um, so when I talk to architects, they intuitively understand. But I also think they get the marketing side of it too. Is I, fundament, I truly believe it's the next wave of sustainable thinking. It is the next paradigm. And I do believe everyone else understands too because there is no greater sustainable system on earth than nature. It's been around billions of years. So you can't argue that. You can't refute that that's the next sustainable thinking if we copy nature. Um, and architects are excited because where we stand now, the challenge is people don't know how to apply biomimicry. When I say to an architect, I do biomimicry, they'll say, what does that mean? Um, and that's where the relationship begins because the architects I'm working with, like B plus H architects in Toronto, asked me to join their team because they want to be biomimetic. They don't know how it applies, they just know that they want to apply it. Um, and that's my role is to work with them. I met with Purple Ink Studio last night in Bengaluru, mm -hmm. a great group of architects. Um, and they are very interested in that idea of biomimicry as well. So it's, it comes, I think, intuitively from a place of like real understanding that nature has something to teach us and architects have the skills to translate that to design. They have the creative ability to pull those two worlds together and I feel like I sit in the middle where the way I see myself is I, I speak on behalf of nature or I uh, communicate for nature because nature can't speak English. So my PhD was all about understanding ecosystem behaviors because I want to know how can we translate that into engineering design. You talked about design. A lot of the application of biomimicry is to do with products and not with settlements and homes and buildings and such. So how do designers respond to this one question? The other is when you listen to someone like Professor Bala who is breaking down elements, understanding how they behave and then connecting you know, into new synergies and yes. forms. Keeping an eye, of course, constantly on human ecology and application. Yeah. You know, because finally it's not about ecology. No one's going to accept that. Yeah. So how do you see these two things? Design on one side and people like him who are coming from this understanding of elementary uh, behavior patterns of, uh, el of, of uh, components of chemistry and of physics. Well, that's the interesting part is it's a very Newtonian kind of history. Newton helped us break the world down into chunks yeah. and then we could measure those chunks and put them into new configurations that made us a really powerful species. Biomimicry is systems thinking, so what you're doing is taking these parts and putting them into new patterns. Now what if the, that whole process was influenced by nature? You could put them in patterns that are modeled after a sustainable kind of way of doing things. So we've just been putting things together based on our own You don't needs. have to be polite to him. You can go ahead and... <laughs> no, but I think it's valuable to respect where we've come from because that's what's going to ultimately get us to where we need to go. So Newton, I don't think it's a bad thing that we can do the things that we do. We've just gone off course because we've... For example, we can use and harness energy unlike any other organism on the planet. Once we learned how to control fire, we made materials and environments for our own good. And now we're learning that we've outgrown our system and we've become unsustainable in that path. So um, it's, it's so important to have people like Professor here who have that intelligence to be able to put these things, break them apart and put them in new configurations that are informed and modeled after nature. Um, the designers, the products, like I said, that's a sexy idea. The urban ecologies, the ecosystem stuff, that's the complex th thinking that um, I think the next generation gets. I think they can actually put things together in very creative ways. They can deal with complexity a lot in a, in a new way. And I've noticed that teaching, even with the professors who are retiring, I hear often that the next generation is like, I hear very, they're hopeless, they're not smart. And I think what we're missing is actually the beauty and the brilliance of their intelligence might not be from a historical perception. It might not be historical brilliance. They see brilliance, their brilliance is in how they can deal with complexity and put things together unlike we've ever done before. So. Um, that's why the commons is an education space too, is because I want to tap into that brilliance. Um, and then we put things together, we can break it apart and put it together 
in a biomimetic or a bio-inspired way that, is, and then it'll, I mean, that's, yeah, we can make products, but my whole reason I'm working with landowners and city developers um, is because I want to shift systems. Jimmy, could you talk a little bit about the Harare building, which is biomimetic? Yeah, the Harare building is, um, uh, Mick Pierce is the architect, and he developed it based on a termite mound. Um, it has actually a couple biomimetic properties. And before I say that, I will say a lot of people do biomimicry without knowing it, like um, you were saying. Uh, so right now, for me, biomimicry is a lot of storytelling. Uh, Mick Pierce consciously used the termite mound, and what the termites, the termite mound, its context can fluctuate from 40 degrees to, do, to 2 degrees in the in 24-hour period. Very hot days and pretty cool nights. Inside the mound, the temperature maintains a constant temperature of 32 degrees, plus or minus 1 degree. So he was interested, how does it do that without any pumps, gas, energy? And it's all through the ventilation system. So first of all, um, the materials that they use to create the nest are just dung, saliva, and soil. So they make a natural material, and it's very porous, so it breathes on its own. So already you've got a, a, you know air transfer in the material. To add to that, the termites will actually create tunnels in the, in the section above the ground. Um, and those tunnels will also start to support ventilation. They're cleverly adapting those vents throughout the day depending on wind patterns. So, like, um, I, I whitewater canoe and when you go down a rapid, you can always hang out behind the rock because the water's creating these eddies and it's curling back. So the same principle with the termite mound, um, the mound will put positions its holes in such a way that it eddies around and will actually suck air in like a vacuum and pull it up. To support that air transfer, they also harvest fungus at the bottom, at the root um, of the termite mound. So that methane, that methane gas that's created is floating up and pulling air as well. So you're constantly pulling and recirculating air and that fresh air will be pulled in and dropped down because it's more dense and create, allow fresh air and then it'll pull the hot air up. So it's a little bit about adaptive strategies and um, really air transfer. And so what Mick Pierce did is he created a perforated um, uh, shopping center. And the other thing that he did that's biomimetic is that he made a lot of microclimates. So microclimate meaning uh, he made a lot of, um, what did... There's an, an Indian word that I just learned last night. Oh, the jolly. Jolly. Yeah. <laughs> so he used that kind of same technology where there's lots of shading, and that shading will create little microclimates, so you'll get little wind patterns, and that's what nature is very good at, at the micro scale. It works, it does work system scale, but at the micro scale, you'll see even elephant skin, the wrinkles of elephant skin allow moisture to get trapped into the, into the ridges, and to allow um, uh, more ventilation and cooling, natural air conditioning. Um, it's the same idea in the, in the shopping center. So it's perforated, pulling air up and creating this kind of stack effect. But at the same time, at a micro scale, he's got lots of shading or lots of shadows that actually create a microclimate that's pulling air in and creating the ventilation. So that's how that works. I have a question. I go to a remote park away from my house, three yeah. kilometers, one way to leave that park. And this year they train very heavily in uh, Bangalore. Yeah. And there's an anthill out there. And I was wondering why I didn't get washed off. So out of curiosity, I went and tapped it. And I found the structural strength was phenomenal. Yeah. So what's the reason that it didn't kind of melt off in the heavy rain? Which, which structure? The, the, the termite mound? Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I know with ants in their mound, when they... Uh, when they create the little turrets and you can pour yeah, water. Is he burning up the saliva? Yes, yeah. They coat it with that, the ants do. Right. And the termites do. And so, so on the outside, it's sort of waterproof. Yes. And it doesn't, uh, unless you do something violent to it. Yeah. It no, I tried to do that, it was very tough. Yeah, what, so was. what you normally do is that a lot of our practice is also based on a lot of biology. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. But actually, with the ants, we. It's that they are bigger urban designers than we think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they place themselves mm -hmm. in uh, the rain shadows mm -hmm. most often. As, of course, they're sensitive to moisture, they're sensitive to what is below the ground too. 
but they plan and place themselves in a way that it's in, uh, most of them brain shadow. Mm -hmm. So that way they get protected. You can see smartly the way they, if you take a floor of a forest or a floor of, of a park, you might see that it is all protected mm -hmm. in some form or the other. And the way they actually work with uh, some leaves of the cold water for a longer period of time before mm -hmm. they trip out. So they start sheltering themselves that way. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, yeah. And at an ecosystem scale, like for biomimicry at a system scale, a forest, I mean, we create our environments to uh, have somewhat stable conditions. That's why we have an air conditioner in here. A forest is doing the very same thing. It doesn't like to be disrupted from environmental changes. Um, so that's a great example of like, a forest canopy will dissipate all the rain, so the energy that hits is, is very light. At the same time, it's creating a microclimate in that, so um, you have pretty constant temperatures, humidity, uh, wind pressures, and that's why when you cut a tree down, um, if you look at a forest, especially in Canada, you don't see one tree that's 600 feet above the other ones. Like our, our economic system kind of runs on that model, who can grow the tallest the fastest? A forest intuitively has an understanding that it works better if we're all the same height, if we have that strong canopy, because as soon as you cut a tree down, you now have a hole for that wind to come in and make a little bit of disruption, a little bit of noise. So a termite mound built in a context, I mean, a lot of them might be in the desert, so they have to be rigid and they have to be strong, um, or they'll be in a, in a more arid region. But in a forest, you have that dissipation and you have so much creativity in terms of organism design um, because you have those constant temperatures. So the one thing Janine, she said to me when I first met her is, if you want to see some of the craziest designs, go to the most uninhabitable places, to the deserts, to the depths of the ocean, because organisms go there because there's no predators, but they go there, they have to be inc incredibly clever and, in and in inventive. So that's where you'll find some really interesting ideas. But if you want to know how to build a community, go to a forest. And that's where you'll see sustainable systems. That's where you'll see uh, diversity. You'll see inclusion. You'll see everyone's working. There's no unemployment in a forest. Um, and everyone has the opportunity to innovate. And they have to innovate. There's that, what I call, uh, coopetition. There's cooperation. Trees will share and distribute resources through their mycelium. They'll, they'll donate food and water. But at the same time, they're promoting competition because competition is good for evolution. So that's why the incubator space and all these incubator spaces, yes, we should have competition, but at the same time, let's give the resources to these spaces for people to have that opportunity to self-organize and come up with new ideas. So we have constantly this debate uh, in our practice, too. that is, uh, you have biomimicry and, let's say, extended arms or the bottom of arms are biophilia and yeah. the entire, entire system, as I say. The divide always has been that one, you drive technology to the highest level. Mm -hmm. so that's what, uh, let's say, a technologist would look at uh, biomimicry. Mm -hmm. We've been always dis kind of seeing at practice level that whether we can look at it from the passive right approach. Yeah. So, how we can blend the passive right side of uh, architecture or design to mimic uh, at the biomimicry level. When you say, pa what do you mean by passive? So what happens otherwise, let's say a lot of people discussed earlier was all technology driven. Right, yes. I can right. add yes. this technology, I can add another technology. Then yep. it becomes technology here. Yep. And usually with technology, there is a problem that, uh, my, it's like the cell phone, right? So every second or third day you have a new model, <laughs> new technology, and this becomes outdated. Yeah. But architecture or the built environment survives 50, 60 years, or 100 years, yeah. as much as it wants to survive. So how does... Mimicking, yeah. And, uh, how does the blend of actually passive? So, whatever technology you add, it doesn't disrupt the bit. Right. But it just enhances the bit. Yeah. So that's that's the debate we constantly have. Yeah. So we kind of force feed in, in the way we do architecture from largely being passive right. Yes. So when we start placing things passive right. Yeah. It could be any any number of values. Do you see that as a gap? you see from a, from a biomimicry, biophilia, yeah. biotechnology point of view? No, I actually see them all very complementary. Okay. And I agree with you. That there's like a structural form will give the basis for everything else to grow. So if you can build a form in a passive way that's very intelligently attuned to its environment, 
that's why I'm, I'm, I'm very excited with 3D printing, for example. One, as we're starting to 3D print forms and structures, we can do it using computer modeling that's very attuned to environmental conditions and stresses and strains so that you don't have to create the square boxes that we have been doing in the past. And so once you have your skeleton, just like the human body, then you put the layers on top of that. The skeleton gives the form for everything else to grow, so then you can put the technologies, you can do the biophilia, um, you can have the ad adaptive facades or kinetic facades, you can have these things that adapt to the environment, but like our skeleton, it doesn't change that much, whereas our skin is changing quite frequently, or our hair, or all these you know, exterior things. Great. Fascinating. I know this conversation can go for <laughs> Yeah, hours. I can talk for too long, yeah. I think we should close this end of it. And yeah. I, like I wrote to you, we'll see how we can take some, some part of it. For sure, yeah. Greetings and uh, from Ikorai. I hope you can uh, hear me out there. This is uh, Hari Harun from uh, the Altec Foundation. Uh, you heard uh, for the last 20 plus minutes uh, Professor Jamie Miller, Dr. Jamie Miller, who used to teach for, for about five years uh, in Canada. Uh, eventually, about a year ago, decided to move away from teaching and started this practice. Really enables architects in their in some consulting modes to try and see how they can push this dimension of biomimicry and architecture. Fascinating listening to him, and uh, I would reckon that you will want to watch this once again when we put it up on the eco archives of the Altec Hub website uh, in a way that it captures some of the final nuances of what Jamie Miller was offering in the last 20 plus minutes. We have now another 19 odd minutes. Well, of course, I will keep inviting you to see if you can put up your questions. And Jimmy is on the uh, on the line just now from Canada, and he's waiting to see if there will be questions coming up from all of you, from Australia to the UK to uh, Europe, and of course, US and Canada, apart from those from India itself. I see today, a decent uh, participation. Number of people have come in today. Uh, well, the number seems to be larger than 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 the last week. And thank you for thank you to all of you for having uh, you know chosen to spend this hour with us. Uh, now we run this one wonderful and a short clip on on uh, how Jamie sees biomimicry, but from a slightly different context from the other conversation that we were having. The others that you saw, my last note, the others that you saw in the program are very distinguished professionals themselves. Well, unfortunately, you didn't see their name credits coming up. To the left of uh, Jamie Miller was uh, Mr. Christian, uh, who is the chairman of the Skill Council for Green Jobs. To Jamie's right was another distinguished person, called Benedict Perman, who is the, who is the editor of uh, something called Sustainability Next, which is nearly a decade old as a web magazine uh, uh, on, on the market. And Benedict, uh, thank you for being there. I can see that you are also participating today with us. Uh, the 
other gentleman to uh, to the far left of uh, Jamie was Amit Naik, who posited quite a few interesting and thoughtful questions to keep the conversation going. Well, I will leave that at that and uh, see that uh, um, we run this next part of it. Uh, listen to Jimmy Miller on this sex session section, which has a deal more to offer. There's an incredible part in this book that I just read called The Tiger. And in it, the author, John Valiant, introduces the research of a man named Charles Brain. So Brain's a paleontologist. But in the 60s and 70s, he was studying fossils in Transvaal. And he became really intrigued by a troop of cliff-dwelling baboons. In fact, he became so intrigued that he, did a, he wanted to do an experiment. This is how it went. He's going to clamber up into the caves where they sleep. He's going to wait for them to come back from whatever bam baboons do during the day. He's going to wait for them to come in, rest down for the night, and then he was going to scare them. Seems like a surefire plan. His idea is he wanted to see if he could scare them outside of the cave. He wanted to see if he was more scary or scarier than, than what existed outside the cave in the dark and that uncertainty. What happened was they stayed inside the cave. And so there was Charles, stuck in a cave with 30 irate, panicked baboons in the dark. What I find interesting about the story is, well, for one, that he did it. Um, I was trying to imagine trying to get that past a PhD proposal committee. I'm going to climb in a cave of baboons and scare them, see what happens. But also, I'm intrigued by the way that he, or by the behavior of the baboons. And to me, it seems like they were more afraid of going outside into this uncertain dark than they were of the intruder, which is peculiar, because what if that intruder was something more disastrous than a paleontologist? What I also find interesting about this story is that it kind of resembles our situation. Here we are today, we're talking about the future. And a lot of our discourse revolves around the idea of sustainability and the sustainability of our future. I like to imagine us living in a house of technology. And this house is something that we've been building for a long time. And with each new scientific discovery and new idea, we add to the walls of this house of technology. So much so that our lives are pretty much dictated by this house of technology, and very little of our daily lives exists outside it. And so why I see this as similar to the caves is that well, we kind of taught, we're, uh, we're playing around with two different stories. Well, one, we can change the walls of this house of technology. We can adapt the technologies that we're comfortable with. But there's also another story of actually stepping outside the back door of this technology and embracing a completely new metaphor and a new paradigm of sustainability. Now, either way, it's kind of scary to think about. And in my research, I've realized that this fear is a universal fear. There's a psychologist named Jordan Peterson who who says that many organisms, including ourselves, have an innate fear of uncertainty. And we respond with the th same three mechanisms. We, we, we get taken aback, we withdraw. And as we do that, our heart starts to race and we become anxious. And then the third one is we become very cautious, our senses are alerted. But what if I told you that we could confront this uncertainty not on our own? What if I told you we could embrace possible 30 million examples of incredible ways of powering our future and creating functional, sustainable, and beautiful designs to universal problems like flight, like packaging, like creating complex structures and materials, using and creating color, or creating adhesives. This is the idea of biomimicry. 
And for me, it's completely changed everything. In a definition, biomimicry is the conscious emulation of the forms and the processes and the systems in nature to solve worthy problems. And more than that, it's a fundament fundamental transition in the way that we view nature, not as something that we could take from, but something that could actually teach us. And so far, the results of <laughs> Applied that to a wind turbine blade and found it's 20% more efficient, runs at slower wind speeds, and is quieter. Mercedes Benz, they went to the recent dwelling boxes. You guys want one? <laughs> they went to the reef dwelling boxes and, and emulated that form, because reality is we're not lying down in cars yet. We still need to sit up, so they're kind of boxes. But they didn't even stop there. They're also inspired by foam. And bones are super clever because they add material where the stresses and strains are highest, and they remove materials where there is no stress and strain. So by doing this, they've created a lighter car without compromising the safety. The fuel efficiency of this car gets 70 miles per gallon, and it has a, a drag coefficient of 0.19. There's a group of young entrepreneurs at Smith, and they're inspired by Ivy. What's cool about ivy is that they can mold to any shape. They're incredible climbers. That doesn't have to be a flat, boxy shape like the way we usually collect energy from the sun via our solar panels. They can mold to, sh to different shapes. They're inspired by that and they made the solar ivy, which does a similar function. It's a solar collecting mechanism that can attach to many different forms and different shapes. But they didn't stop there. They're also inspired by the way that the leaves rustle in the wind. And they thought, what if we collected that energy too? So these solar leaves actually collect the kinetic energy in the stems while simultaneously collecting the energy from the sun. I love this idea, but I know that bio-inspired designs is not new. And I'm not going to try and convince you that it is. People like Leonardo da Vinci, or if you know the architect Antonio Gaudi in, in Barcelona, Spain, they were both looking to nature for inspiration. Or even further back, you go to the Inuit, and the way they looked at polar bear dens to make igloos, or they copied the shape of an Arctic hare foot to make snowshoes. Bio-inspired bio designs is not new, but why I think biomimicry is so inviting and so intriguing is that it comes at a time where we've become completely fascinated with our own house of technology, and I think we've kind of forgotten that outside the house of this technology are, is the culmination of 3.8 billion years of research, development, and incredible design. And I think it's this, this, this idea that makes me so attracted to it and so intrigued. When I graduated from, from school, uh, I did a degree in environmental engineering and international development. And I would say I was fairly disillusioned at the prospect of our future. It seemed a little disheartening. But I worked on a couple projects in, in Indonesia and Sri Lanka on tsunami relief. And it was there that I started to see solutions in literally wild places. When we were trying to figure out how to make more tsunami-resistant houses, we were really intrigued by looking at the destruction and all around it, the organisms and even ecosystems that didn't seem touched or seemed unharmed. And when we were trying to create breakwater berms to help dissipate future energy or the waves, uh, waves energy, it was intriguing to see as well that anywhere where the mangrove forest was intact or where there's an intact coral reef, inland of those, the the human-made designs fared much better than without those. And really interestingly, we were trying to figure out an early warning mechanism or early warning system. And we came across countless stories of people telling us about domesticated and non-domesticated animals that days prior to the actual event all shot up uphill um, away from the coastline. That's when my mind started to change, and that lens started to change, and I started to see that outside of this house of technology we've created, there are some good ideas. And what was also really intriguing was that these ideas are all free. They're accessible by, accessible by anyone. Even if you don't have access to nature, your human body is an incredible design. And this has started to, and, and in that sense, there are no trademarks, there are no patents, it's all freely shared. That has started to, started to deepen my conversation with the natural world and the questions that I ask. And what I've realized is that nature is incredibly hard to emulate. 
For example, making a box car or a box fish inspired car. That's a great idea. You know, I think it's super cool and it, and it improves the efficiency of an automobile. But it doesn't change the fundamental problem with our dependency on oil or the, we still use a classic manufacturing technique of heat, beat, and treat. When I met Janine Benyus, she's the woman who coined the term biomimicry back in 2007, she said to me, well, there's a difference between our house of technology and the natural world, and that is nature builds with a beguiling simple set of common raw materials that are procured locally, manufactured at body temperature and body pressure, and all processed silently in water. For example, a spider silk. What an incredible design. It has a strength to weight ratio stronger than any material we've ever created. It uses only the energy of the sun to produce it. it. Makes it in the stinking critter's belly. And not only that, it's completely biodegradable, which means it goes right back to where it came from. And I, in fact, a lot of spiders will actually eat the silk and reuse it. And this is the conversation that I'm trying to have with the natural world and through biomimicry. It's not just to change the shape of our technologies and the, the way that our technologies look, but I'm trying to figure out how do we do design differently. For example, uh, there's a designer named Bill Reed, and he said the story once that if you're driving to Mexico and you need to get to Canada, which is a lovely place this time of year, you're not going to get there by slowing down. You're going to have to turn around at some point. You're going to have to step outside of that house of technology, that cave and you're going to have to embrace a fundamentally new idea. Now, it's not to say we don't want to try and slow down because taking a turn at 300 miles an hour is a little bit tricky. So yeah, we can slow down and improve the technologies that we're so comfortable with, but there's a point where we're going to have to think of a fundamentally new idea. For example, I think of our buildings, and the fact that every single building has an HVAC system just means that the design before it was pretty poor. I mean, why didn't we design that before so that we didn't have to build on a bad idea? I mean, for example, termite mounds. If you've ever seen a termite mound, that is the world's greatest HVAC system. And I'll tell you the story. I wasn't going to, but a termite mound can live in an environment that fluctuates from 2 degrees at night to 40 degrees in the heat of the day. Inside the actual mound, it, it maintains a 31 degrees Celsius. This is Celsius, by the way, sorry. <laughs> um, 31 degrees Celsius, plus or minus a degree at all times. An incredible gradient outside and yet through its networking, through its tunnel, through its gas exchange, and its playing with the wind, it can maintain a constant temperature inside. Now that's clever design. So back to this deeper idea of biomimicry and embracing a new methodology, a new metaphor. This is something that I'm intrigued by. And I'm trying to figure out, well, how do we transition then? Because like I said earlier, when we're confronted with uncertainty, there's withdrawal, there's anxiety, and there's caution. But I forgot to mention that there's actually a fourth one, and that's courageous exploration. Jordan Peterson says that if you can embody those three things, those, that fear essentially, and then courageously confront this uncertainty, it's those organisms that then can adapt, evolve, and survive. So how do we transition from this old way of thinking? How can we do that without scaring the heck of it or out of ourselves? And what I found is nature does transitions all the time, and I've asked the question to ecosystems. If you clear cut a forest, or if, you, um, if there's a forest fire, some catastrophic release of energy and resources and materials all go back into the land, what happens is an incredible phenomenon. Life grows again. These are called R species, and what they do is they come into an ecosystem and they'll start to try. They're actually called the innovator species because they come and they try. They live and they die quickly. But there's a big difference. When they die, nature builds to make sure that it's safe fail, whereas we try to make designs that are fail safe. So these organisms, these R species, are continually coming in and they try and they live and they, and they quickly die. And they're doing a really important function. Well, for, for one, they're literally providing the groundwork for the next ecosystem to evolve. So they're providing the soils and the nutrients. But also they're testing. They're finding out what works here. What's the soil condition like? What kind of sunshine is here? So they're making sure that whatever comes next is locally attuned and adaptive, and is appropriate. Up in Canada, this is what we're trying to play with. We're trying to become weeds. As we transition into this new idea of thinking, we're trying to find ways to convince people, policymakers, engineers, 
to confront this uncertainty, to try new ideas from the fundamental basis, to ask those fundamental questions. And the one thing we've done is we've created a collaboration. We're called the B Collab. And what it is, it's a, essentially a collection of unlikely collaborators. We have farmers, do-it-yourselfers, biologists, engineers, researchers. And our primary, primary function is to do biomimicry. One of the big projects that we're working on is a 17 hectare development, urban development, on the outskirts of the city of Guelph. And we're taking that metaphor of being weeds into this actual design as well. And the first thing we're doing is we're creating a design studio. And the studio is really just a platform for people to come and engage in learning about this place, trying new ideas, trying new designs, and seeing how they work, just like a weed would. So before anything else, we're making this design studio our primary function. And so we even have hiking trails going through there so that neighborhood people, kids, there's a Boy Scout camp across the river, they can join us and all participate in this design. And the purpose is, for example, to have biologists come and learn about the ecosystem, to do testing. We have a partnership between a biological university and a design university. So we can have the biologists come in and tell us about the land. And then we can have engineers and designers play with that information and try new energy technologies. What, what are the conditions in this place and how can we make very locally appropriate technologies? Not thinking about the traditional grid system. Let's start over. Let's pretend we just clear cut this whole land. How would you do energy? Why do, we do, why do we use electricity? Asking these fundamental questions. And then through this design, we're gonna hopefully create an opportunity for the community to self-emerge. And whatever comes out of that is hopefully locally appropriate and co-evolves with the natural world instead of trying to cut it down and start um, from scratch. So how do I think we power the future? I think we become weeds. And what that means is I think we get in our little groups and we collaborate with unlikely collaborators. And we try. And we try and we fail at smaller scales. And through that trying and learning, we start to provide I guess a sense of hope to the larger community, the larger system. For example, that urban design, we're working with city planners and trying to convince them to use this as a test site almost, for them to get comfortable with new ideas so that when they inevitably have to grow outside their boundaries, that they can maybe do it with a new metaphor, a new way of thinking. So we try. I think this is a, an incredible idea, this biomimicry and this bee collab, because one, it supports collaboration. It's inclusive. We had, in fact, a, we did a workshop with a bunch of high school students who we were playing with um, hagfish. If you guys don't know about hagfish, go check them out. It's incredible. Um, they are playing with hagfish, and we had all the postdocs and the PhD students kind of standing around uh, smirking and giggling at some of the stupid questions we were asking. By the end of it, every single one of them had their notebook out because these high school students were asking questions that was changing their research. Even the professor that we were working with, Dr. Doug Fudge, he's an international leader in hagfish research. He too had a whole new booklet and a whole new research project because these students were asking really childlike questions. So we can all be biologists, and that's the beauty about biomimicry. We can see design in the natural world, and it's inclusive. But not only that, it supports divergent thinking. And thirdly, it supports a sense of hope that we don't have to confront this uncertainty alone, that there are 30 million species out there that do the same thing and solve similar problems to us. And these are three things that I think we're in desperate need of. And so I call this the great collaboration because I think it changes and bridges the disconnect between you, between me, and between the, every other living organism on this planet. Thank you very much.
Hello, this is uh, Jamie Miller speaking. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Okay. But um, to answer the one question, yeah, the presentation, um, they showed two videos, one of a conversation I had in India last week, and then one uh, TED Talk um, that I did in 2012. Both of those are still online. So if you've missed that presentation, uh, you're free to go and check those out online. Um, I'm not sure if there'll be a link available, but uh, I can certainly send you one um, myself. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I'd be happy to uh, chat more about biomimicry um, and what's going on. Sorry, and what's going on with some of those projects that were presented. Hi, Jamie. Am I audible? This is Indrajit here. Yes, I can hear you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, I just uh, heard your TED talk. It was brilliant. I mean, you know, something that is really, really close to my heart. You know, you, you talked about um, different, you know, different thinking. To, to design systems. Now, one thing I wanted to ask is, you see, while biomimicry is good, a basic difference between how nature design systems or why nature design systems and why we humans design is the aspect of greed or short-term benefit, right? I just wanted to ask, you know, when we are designing systems, how do you design a system which is so robust that it can withstand human greed? That's a, it's a very good question. Um, because nature is not greedy. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, I don't know how to answer that question because it's a difficult thing to um, try to control a huge population. We all have the freedom of independent thought. So, um, and that's the kind of interesting conversation I'm having right now is a lot of our technologies that we've grown up with are very control based. So. We try to control our environments or through policies and governance, we try to control uh, how people behave and act. And there's good reason for that because those outliers, whether they be greedy or they might uh, harm somebody, we want to make sure that they don't have the freedom to do that. But at the same time in nature, everything has the freedom to do whatever it wants. So you can have parasitic organisms that totally take over um, a body, or you could have things like locusts, locusts which will, in a greedy sense, completely swarm and take over a crop. Um, but that freedom, within that freedom, there's still sustainability, the system still survives. Um, so I'm not sure how to do it because I don't wanna, I, I want people to have creative freedom. And I guess 
way I'll answer this is what I'm working on is uh, something called the Biomimicry Commons in Canada. And it's an incubator space that focuses on accessing individuals' creative freedom. Because I think when people are in tune with um, what really makes them come alive, there is an agreed aspect. Um, meaning like I want to explore how people can come become free because I think it's fear. Um, and I think, I think it's fear that inspires greed. Greed is, I think, a, is a, um, a symptom of fear. Uh, people get greedy because they don't think that they have enough or they live in a paradigm of fear. Um, so the commons in Canada is about uh, getting people to step out of fear and to live in a world where, of abundance. Because in nature, nature is a world of abundance. When you let it be, there's abundance of opportunity, there's abundance of resources. Um, and even though uh, you know, you're creative in how you uh, exploit and get those, uh, those uh, resources, um, there is an abundance. So that's one side is to look and focus on people's individual freedom and creativity and building from a space of abundance rather than a fear uh, of not enough. Now, the other thing that we're doing is we're partnering with Indigenous um, people in Canada, the First Peoples of Canada. And what they focus on is something called seven generations of thinking. You may have heard of this, but um, instead of building for your own generation, which is what we're doing now, it's more of a, um, a short-sightedness. Um, indigenous people built for seven generations. So thinking about the seventh generation from their current spot. And that mentality gives you this kind of uh, perspective to really focus on how do you create systems that aren't greedy, but that will actually sustain and support the seven generations after you. Um, so those are two kind of things that uh, we're looking at in the biomimicry commons in Canada. Um, but it's a really good question because greed, um, I don't think it's something you can totally control. It's more about inspiring people to live outside of greed and more specifically, inspiring people to live outside of fear. Thank you so much. I think that was a really insightful answer. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the question. It's a great question. Now, if there are no other uh, questions, can I ask one more? That's Indrajit here again. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Okay. The other thing was about the tragedy of the commons, right? Mm -hmm. So, within a community, you know, when there is a resource, everybody wants to socialize the costs and privatize the profits, which is also uh, what is seen in corporates across the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and which which essentially uh, influences any kind of decision making globally, whether um, it's an economic decision or related to environment or societal decision. So you know, no matter what decision you take, that is what is predominant. You know, mm -hmm. bringing the biomimicry aspect into this, how do you address you know the tragedy of the commons? Especially when you're designing common resources, you know. right? Could you could you just ask the question again so that I'm unclear? Yeah. So what I wanted to ask is, when you're designing common resources, okay, in a community, mm -hmm. the focus of individuals is to privatize profits and socialize costs. So, for example, if you have a common link. Everybody yeah. wants to fish in the lake, but nobody wants to yeah. contribute to its upkeep, you know, typically. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, you know, when you are designing systems, how do you mm -hmm. ensure that the tragedy of the commons is avoided? You know, taking yeah. some learnings from biomimicry. 
Yeah, it's a good it's a good good question again. Um, and um, I'm not sure how to totally answer it, but something that popped to my mind was Portland in Portland, Oregon. Um, I did some research on uh, that city because it's consistently seen as a top city to live in. And I was intrigued as to why, what made Portland, Oregon and the United States so different from the rest of the world. And one of the things that um, I found was people were more inclined uh, to develop social wealth rather than private wealth. Um, meaning people were more inspired to develop uh, systems in their community that supported the community. So things like art in the park, or they'd have movies in the park, or they'd have more public spaces, rather than getting, you know, the next big car, um, or, or getting, you know, the next big house. And they found that their wellness and happiness quotient or index was much higher than um, other cities that didn't focus on that. So the tragedy of the commons, um, I think, is a social uh, behavior that has to be adopted or built into a system. So um, it's, it's very fun to explore. We're, we're designing a community right now in Canada that's biomimetic, and we're looking at how we can use form and structure and patterns to promote that more social behavior. Um, so the way we, can, we actually call it free market communalism, and the free market part is it's not capitalism and it's not communism. It's free market meaning everyone has the freedom to create um, in continuity with their own desires, with their own purpose. Like, what are they really inspired by? What are they really good at? Um, we want to promote that. But at the same time, the free market and the communal part is that it's done within the framework uh, of the community and the commons. So how do we inspire people to make things that are incredible, um, but that don't soil the natural environment or, or the community that they live in? Um, and you can take lots of examples from nature to to kind of inspire that. So you think of a nest, any bird, there's a there's the old saying of don't soil your own nest. Um, but you can look at other super organisms like ants and how they create communities in a way that support the whole culture, the whole community um, mm -hmm. and support more life. And then I guess the, the other thing is following the tenant, Biomimicry 3.8 says, um, the fundamental tenet of biomimicry is to create condition, conditions that are conducive to life. So everything we do, um, we, we really are driven by that. Does it create more life? Does it create more diversity? Does it inspire more life? Um, if you can do that, then you're truly emulating nature because that is what happens in the natural uh, environment. So um, whether it be building patterns um, uh, with our houses, um, or even building houses that are fully biodegradable, fully recyclable, can be broken down to their basic constituent parts. Um, that's, yeah, that's what we're really focusing on. So to answer your question, I think it's a behavior that can be inspired by design, but has to really be adopted by a community. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just throwing questions that you which have bothered me for many years because uh, you know I, I want to build systems at a very large scale so yeah. you know I, I'm not sure if these sound abstract at times no I think that's it's good to have that in mind and I think um, one I, I agree with you I, we should I want to build systems at large scale too and one of the things I learned in my PhD research was the importance of starting at small scale. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was teaching at OCAD, one of the things that we would do is we would um, envision a, an, a fictional future. So something way down, you know, 10 years or 20 years down the road. Um, and we called it design fiction. And what that means mm -hmm. is it's the develop development of believable ideas that may not yet be possible but that provoke mm -hmm. a conversation of what could be or should be possible. So to me, that's like the end. It's, it's the post that you're running. To. Instead of you know, trying to create that whole system, 
inspire very small scale changes because that's what nature does. And that's what I was referring to mm -hmm. in my TED is um, um, allowing small scale innovation to start to shift or mold towards that design fiction future. Um, because mm -hmm. we humans have a tendency to want to control, like I mentioned. So our tendency might mm -hmm. be to get to that large scale system is to like get there as hard and fast as we can to create you know large changes. But um, real dramatic mm -hmm. change takes time and small scale evolution. So even a tree falling in a forest, um, which puts resources back into the system, allows new sunlight, new conditions, um, that small scale disruption allows for new organisms to start to grow in that area. And that might start a chain mm -hmm. reaction. Um, so I use that as kind of a metaphor is how can we create small technologies that are inspired by your vision that might lead mm -hmm. to your vision, but not necessarily because you have to allow for the uncertainty. And one of the examples mm -hmm. I like is kind of Uber, the, the car sharing company. Um, they created a very mm -hmm. small scale technology that disrupted a system, a very established mm -hmm. system in terms of how we uh, do ride share, how we do transportation in a city. Um, and they made us fundamentally kind of shift our thinking of how, how a taxi behaves or what the taxi industry is. And that's what mm -hmm. I think we can do is create small scale biomimetic technologies uh, that shift mm -hmm. our thinking and, and, and disrupt a system at small scales. And that might lead to your design fiction, um, to your final mm -hmm. end, end goal. So um, that's what I'm working on is inspiring people to create these small scale disruptions uh, to shift a system mm -hmm. safely instead of you know, waiting mm -hmm. for a cataclysmic disaster to give us that, you know, that new canvas to paint on. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'd agree with you because, uh, you know, as a student of entrepreneurship, um, mm -hmm. I pretty much follow the same principles uh, that you said about yeah. failing small, you know, and there's a lot of literature that talks about, uh, you know, doing a lot of small scale pilots so that you yeah. understand what works well. And then when you've uh, learned from them, you know, something that really is working well for the market, because, you know, essentially you're creating a product for the market, right. then you start to scale that up. So I think, you know, in a sense, that small scale uh, system design, which, um, you know, realistic but visionary uh, future is, is yeah. at the core of uh, both what we do at, uh, you know, human scale or what nature does, uh, you know, in, in uh, in by itself. So yeah, yeah I think exactly. that there's something there. Exactly. And it's interesting, just I think of a tree and the way that a tree will um, innovate at multiple scales. So you're thinking it's constantly taking information in at the leaves, at the bark, at the roots, um, at the branching patterns. It's taking information in and making adaptations at multiple scales, like the genetic level. Um, the shape mm -hmm. and the color of the bark or, or the thickness of the bark, the way the leaves are positioned or shaped or colored. All of this adaptation mm -hmm. is happening at small scales. It's not a tree making a dramatic change. It's, it's the parts of the tree changing um, somewhat independently. It's, uh, it's like an intelligent uh, you know, system with sub-intelligent components. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's interesting. You can I mean, think of that. In an inherent kind of intelligence in each component. Yes. Yes. And you could see, you could use that metaphor um, in our own society. And that's what I'd like to believe is that we're made up of sub-intelligence. All of us individuals are incredibly intelligent um, and have something to offer. Uh, and that's what it is. Like if we can inspire everyone to offer their own brilliance, and have it be inspired by biomimetry or, or more um, mentored or modeled after, uh, after nature. Uh, and I think we could be on a good path towards a sustainable future. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's really wonderful talking to you and uh, you know, time and opportunity permitting, I'd love to have an offline discussion with you. Yeah, please feel free to reach out um, to anyone online. Um, on my website, biomimicryfrontiers.com, you can find my contact information. So I'd be happy to continue the conversation.
All right, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the time to chat and I appreciate everyone uh, tuning in. Um, if you do have any other questions, again, please feel free to reach out and um, send me an email. Uh, maybe we could set up a time to talk, but uh, I'd be happy to answer them. It looks like we might uh, wind up unless there's any other questions. I'll give you one last shot. All right. Well, thank you so much for setting this up, and uh, I look forward to continuing. All right. Everyone, have a great day. We'll talk soon. Thank you, Jamie. Have thank a good you. day, too.